And it's too high to climb. One, two, one, two, three, four. Good morning, K Cup. What a joy it is to be together with you all this morning. I invite you to stand as you're able as we begin our time together with some songs. the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless with seat for just a moment. Welcome everyone to Camp Covenant Church. My name is Peter. I'm one of the pastors here. It is so great to be with you this morning at Camp Cove where we are pursuing joyful wholeness and loving our neighbor. Um, 
there's a couple things I'd like to bring to your attention before we continue. First, if you could either pull out the Connect card, scan the QR code, uh, or if you're online, you could go to kentcovorg slash welcome. Let us know you're here. We'd love to connect with you. Uh, and by going to those places, uh, one way that we can connect with you is you can sign up for our weekly email that gives you all the information of all the stuff going on in the life of the church. Uh, you can also submit prayer requests there. We want to be able to support you in prayer, uh, both for things you need and things that you're celebrating that God has already done. We love being able to pray for our community. Um, so please take a moment to do that. And also, just if you've come ready to give a gift or tithe this morning, we do have boxes in the back cleverly labeled the box. You're welcome to drop them in there. Uh, you can also do that online in a lot of different ways as well. You can go to our website for more information about that. A couple things going on this week in the life of our church, or at least coming up tonight. Young adults, we're meeting at our house, 7 o'clock. Uh, if you'd like information about that, come talk to me after the service. I'd love uh, to, to include you and to have you come and hang out and, and learn and grow together as a community of younger folks, including myself. Just because I'm there, does that mean I'm... No, it doesn't. Uh, but uh, it's great to gather together as a group of young adults trying to figure out life together. So I invite you to come uh, to that. Uh, also, I, you've heard us talk about it. We're doing a, a choir for our Christmas Eve service this year. Rehearsals are starting in two weeks. So uh, November 18th is a Monday night. That's when rehearsals are starting. There's still plenty of time to sign up. Thanks for all of you who have. We've got a good pretty solid group, but we could have more. The bigger the choir, the better it sounds. So if you're interested in singing, please do that. You can do it on the app or on our website. Uh, either way is great. And then lastly, um, lest we forget the reason that we are here and the reason that we gather, we get to celebrate new life in Christ this morning. There's a white rose here on the chancel. Anthony uh, has given his life to Jesus, and we are here to celebrate that good news. So <laughs> praise God for that. Just a wonderful, wonderful thing. That's worth singing about, don't you think? Why don't you stand up one more time uh, as you are able as we continue our time worshiping together? Thy mercy, my God, is the theme of my song. The joy of my heart and the boast of my tongue. Thy free grace alone from the first to the last have won my affection and bound my soul fast. Without thy sweet mercy I could not live here. Sin would reduce me to utter despair. But through thy free goodness, my spirit's revived. And he that first made me still keeps me alive. Thy mercy is more than a match for my heart, which wonders to be. Hardness depart. Dissolved by thy goodness, I fall to the ground. And we for the praise of the mercy I have found. Hallelujah. Thank you. 
take the weak and make them strong. Who calls the lonely to belong? You restore the weary one. Embrace the lost as a daughter or son. Oh, you are good. You are good. For you are life to my soul. You are water to my dry bones. I will not faint, for you have made the stream. worship you this morning because you are good. You are God. You are life. You are peace. You are hope. You are joy. You are light in the darkness. God, things that we desperately need. As we gather this morning with all of our joys and anxieties, with all of our hopes and our fears, you are good. You are God. And you are here with us. No matter what happens to us, around us, or what we do, God, you are here. You could not be closer than you are now. So, Father, we are so grateful to be gathered as your family in your name 
in your house on this beautiful fall morning. God, to say we need you, we need your strength, we need your hope, we need your peace for all that this week has for us and uh, as we go into our lives, even right now in this very moment, God, we need you. And so we are grateful that you are here. Lord, as we encounter you this morning, empower us with your spirit to be your people, to be your light, to be your peace and joy in this world that so desperately needs it. God, we can't make that happen on our own. We need your strength. We need your power. So God, we ask that you would continue to be forming us into the people that live into this joyful wholeness. God, that you would show us real, practical, powerful ways to love our neighbor so that we can be your people in this world. God, we need you. We love you. We are here to give you all that we have because you have given us everything. We love you. We love you. We love you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we worship you this morning and pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, our risen Lord. Amen and amen. You can go ahead and have a seat for a moment. So part of God's story is about the first time people stop trusting God. It's called the fall because it's all about how we fell away from God. It begins like this. When God was done creating a perfect world, the first two humans, Adam and Eve, got to live as a family in a beautiful place called the Garden of Eden. They explored wherever they wanted and took walks with God. And God took care of them like a loving father. The Garden of Eden was a perfect home. In fact, Adam and Eve were so free, they didn't even wear clothes. God wanted everybody to be this free, with no shame or embarrassment. Imagine no death, no secrets, no fighting, no fear, no pain, no loneliness, no anger, no bullies, no sadness, no hunger, no getting left out, no crying, nothing bad ever. This is God's dream for all of us, but part of being free means we get choices. And the first bad choice happened in the Garden of Eden. See, God gave Adam and Eve one rule. Do not eat fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden. God knew if Adam and Eve ate this fruit, they would think they knew everything good and didn't need God anymore. They would stop asking God to take care of them, and they would know about evil, which means they would hurt each other. Sickness would come. They would get old and eventually die. God didn't want any of that to happen, so he told them not to eat the fruit. Now, you might be wondering why God would even make a tree like that in the first place. Why give Adam and Eve a chance to know how to ruin the perfect world? But remember how being free means we get to make choices? God wants us to choose to obey because we love him, not because we have to. And for a while, Adam and Eve chose to trust God and obey him. After all, it was perfect in the garden. But one day, an evil serpent decided he wanted to separate Adam and Eve from God. So he came up with a plan to make Eve think God didn't love her. He said, does God really love you? If he does, why won't he let you eat this juicy, delicious fruit? Eve told the serpent what God had told Adam. If they ate the fruit, they would die. The snake told Eve that God was lying. The fruit would only make her smart. Being smart sounded great. So Eve bit into the fruit. It tasted so good, she gave some to Adam. He ate it too. Well, they didn't drop dead on the spot but things started to change. First, they realized they were naked and felt embarrassed. Before eating the fruit, they only felt happy. Then they heard God coming and ran away. They had never run away from God before. God knew what happened, but he still asked Adam, did you eat the fruit I asked you not to eat? Adam said, Eve made me do it. Eve didn't like being blamed. She said, the serpent made me do it. Really, they had both made a choice to disobey God. God was so sad they chose not to trust him. They had to move away from the beautiful garden. Worse, pain and sadness and death came into the world. It was no longer perfect. This could have been a horrible end to a really sad story. But guess what? It's not. 
God loved Adam and Eve and us so much that he planned a great rescue. Many years later, a rescuer would take the punishment for every bad choice ever made. And because of this rescue, God would one day make the world a perfect home for us again. And that's the story of the fall. So in case you missed it, here's a quick version. God made a perfect world. There was one rule. The serpent tricked Eve. He made her doubt God's love. So Eve broke the rule. Adam broke it too. All the wrong things in the world started. But that's not the end. God really did love them, and all of us. So he began a great rescue plan. And that's a part of God's story. At this time, I'd like to invite our Kent Cove kids to head to these doors over here where they will meet their helpers and go on up to their workshops and uh, church as they go. Let's sing this blessing over them. Go with God to play your part in his story. Go with power bearers of God's glory. Go with peace to love and serve and heal. Go with love and show the world it's real. Go with love. Go with God. Good morning, Kent Cuff. It's good to see you all. I wanted to give you a little heads up because we're going to take a little journey this morning. We're doing things a little bit differently. So we're going to actually have two sermons of 40 minutes each. <laughs> yes, thank you. No, <laughs> no, we're not. Uh, we're going to split the, the sermon into two smaller uh, sermons and... Uh, we've got some family business to attend to with an announcement, and we're going to do some prayer and some extended worship and communion. So we'll just we'll guide you through that as we go, but I wanted to let you know so it's not so abrupt as things uh, happen. So um, we are continuing this morning with our first uh, section, our series about how God is the impossible promise of enough. And we're talking about stewardship and all of the good gifts that God gives to us. And today our text comes to us, there's two separate sections. The first is from Exodus 20 verses 8 to 11 and then Exodus 23 verses 10 through 13. They read like this, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day. And made it holy. Exodus 23, beginning in verse 10. For six years you are to sow your fields and harvest the crops. But during the seventh year, let the land lie unplowed and unused. Then the poor among your people may get food from it. And the wild animals may eat what is left. Do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. Six days do your work. But on the seventh day, do not work, so that your ox and your donkey may rest, and so that the slave born in your household and the foreigner living among you may be refreshed. Be careful to do everything I have said to you. Do not invoke the names of other gods. Do not, the, do not let them be heard on your lips. Please join me in prayer. Bless us this day, O Lord with vision. May this place be a sacred place, a telling space, where heaven and earth meet. Amen. Sabbath is a beautiful concept from the Old Testament. And if you pay attention, it's woven through not just these commands that we read, not just the Ten Command, 
the Ten Commandments or the Ten Words, but through all of the law that Israel was to follow. Now, here's the challenge for us. We are inheritors, willing or not, aware or not, of something that is a hangover, I would say, from the founding of our country. And that thing, in reference to the Sabbath, is the Puritan work ethic. And then the other piece of that. So the Puritan work ethic, this idea that, that you know, six days you work, you work hard, you pull yourself by your own bootstraps. You know, there's all these, these um, aphorisms and sayings and ways of thinking about the world that come that are an inheritance of that. Now, the hard or the, the really dangerous part to our souls is that that gets married to free market capitalism. And then it's produce, 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 consume, consume, consume. There is no rest. There is no break. There is no stop. And part of what happens is that I think we get this a little mixed up. So in the law, the Sabbath applies to not just that rest on the seventh day, but as we heard in the second reading, that rest for, your, for the fields, to set aside for the poor and for the foreigner in your land and for your, and for your slaves, all of those things. God is accounting for everyone and making sure that there's provision so that your, your field would lie fallow once every seven years. And then it's built into the bigger concept of jubilee, where every 40 years God declares a jubilee and every debt is forgiven. Right? Um, but what we do is... We, because of this inheritance that we get, and because of the way we think about work and production and all of those things, I think generally we view Sabbath as a reward for work that God gives. Except for, I want to just point something out. If you look and you read in Genesis 1 and 2, pop quiz... What day are, is humankind created? The sixth day. What day is the Sabbath day? The seventh. What did humankind ever do to earn the Sabbath? Not one thing. Not one thing. And so we have this idea that we work, 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 work to earn a Sabbath. We even have built into our very systems, and I understand this is an oversimplification, so, you know, I get it. But we even have a term for it in business, right? PTO, paid time off. That's what they call it now. They don't call it vacation. They call it PTO, and you only get it when you earn it, right? Now, remember last week we talked about God's economy? God's economy makes no sense to us. In God's economy, we get Sabbath because God is good. We get Sabbath because God is generous. We get Sabbath so that we can work those six days. It's not the other way around. It's not that we work those six days to get Sabbath. If that were the case, I would imagine God would have made us on the, on the first day. And he wouldn't have started counting until we started producing. But no, God creates us on the sixth day. He says not only it was good, but, but it is very good. And then on the seventh day, he says... Welcome to my rest. And then we work following that. Sabbath comes before mankind does anything. Now, you will know if you have been around the church or you've done much reading that, that Sabbath laws became difficult, right? They became, there's all kinds of rules and and trying to figure out, well, what is allowed and what is not allowed and all of those different things. How is it that we figure out, well, what's work and what isn't work? We know that Jesus, one of the ways he got into trouble with the religious leaders was that he and his disciples walked through a grain field and picked 
green as they walked and rubbed their hands together to, to make, you know, to open it up and ate it. And that was work. And that was bad. But Jesus reminds us that Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Right? So this idea that God gives us what we need, it's impossibly enough. It makes no sense in the way that we think about the world. But because God is generous and merciful, he gives us rest so that we might then work and bring honor to him and do all the things that he's called us to do. Now, obviously, this is a very high flyover view of, of Sabbath. There's all kinds of details that I'm just kind of glossing over. But I wanted to press into this idea, right, that we don't earn it. Because here's what I think. I think that the same way that that mentality, that we have to work to earn rest, bleeds into our beliefs about how God works with us when it comes to sin. It slides in there and all of a sudden it's like, well, yeah, we know in theory, we know, you know, mentally, theologically that God is merciful and that he gives us grace even though we don't deserve it. But boy, does that, boy, do we want to slide into that like, well, we've got to earn it somehow. We've got to do some things because God's not just giving, you know, God's not just giving this stuff away even though he is. Right? And I think those two things can be related, right? It's this idea that how can we receive something for nothing? It goes against the very, uh, kind of our very cultural nature, right? I mean, we see it in our culture all the time, and I'm not going to get into all the examples, but I don't think you have to think very hard to see places where people get real worked up if they think somebody's getting something for nothing. Meanwhile, God says, leave your, leave your fields fallow so that those who are poor can come through and get food. Meanwhile, God says, oh, I know that I just created you and you haven't contributed not one thing yet, but here's the Sabbath. Here's the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Doesn't that put a different, um, a different angle on those commandments? Right? It, it comes... I think, at least for me, I've always heard those commandments as very, very negative, right? It's like, there's, there's your, here's your guardrails. Here's the things you can't do, and it feels this way. But when you think of it that way, it's like, oh, no, 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 no. And this is the way, by the way, our brothers and sisters of the Jewish faith think of it. The law is gift. The law is God's provision and care for us. So Sabbath is a gift in which God gives it so that we might be um, fed, we might be uh, refreshed. One of our favorite psalms, the psalm, probably the most well-known of the psalms, kind of, I, I think, plays this out a little bit. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along right paths for his name's sake. Where does the psalm start? It doesn't start in the, in the walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It starts with provision. It starts with God's abundance being poured out that we might uh, be refreshed. He, le- he makes me lie down in green pastures. He, li- he leads me beside still waters. He refreshes my soul. Brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but man, could I use some refreshing these days. The phrase that... Uh, rings in my head from the gospel. You are anxious about many things. But here's the thing. God is impossibly enough. He provides everything we need. He doesn't expect us to earn that refreshment. He gives us that refreshment and that grace. And then he invites us to join him in sharing it and spreading it all over 
with everyone we meet. And so it's my hope that as we reflect on this idea of how God provides for us, that we would see in this command to keep the Sabbath day holy, not a negative restriction, but a gift of restoration and refreshment and bounty and grace. That, friends, is a good gift. Amen. So at this point, we're going to have some family business. Our chair, our chair, church chair, Steve Brozovich is going to come up and share an announcement with you. Then we're going to do a little bit more worship, and then we will continue on with prayer and another reflection. Thanks, Steve. Good morning. Uh, for those of you I haven't met, my name is Stephen Brozovich. It's my honor to serve as Kent Cove's church chair. Um, as I look out this morning, uh, I see the faces of friends, old and new. Some of us are just taking our first steps in this thing called faith. Others of us have been on the road for a long time and are longing for a place to sit down and rest just for a bit. And some of us are approaching cautiously bringing our pain and brokenness and hoping, believing that God sees us and loves us and calls us his own. I believe God is at work here in this community of people called Kent Cove, and I want to thank you for all the ways you give to the life of this church and our surrounding community through your time, your talents, and your financial support. Your financial contributions have made it possible for our church to grow in joyful wholeness and to love our neighbors in tangible ways, touching lives within our community and beyond. Thanks to your support, our mission priority of loving our neighbor continues to make an impact on our local community. Through your financial support and volunteer partnerships with our local ministry partners like Vine Maple Place, World Relief, and Union Gospel Mission, we have been able to provide meals, clothing, and essential supplies to those in need. As we approach the end of the year, I wanted to give you an update on where we stand financially. As of the end of October, our giving and other income is funding our budget at about 85%, which translates to a gap of $227,179 between actual income and our year-to-date expenses. Our staff and ministry teams have been consistently underspending their allotted budgets. In addition, we've implemented a spending freeze for all ministries to help control costs. Our annual approved budget was $1,440,973. Expenses through the end of October are $1,252,940. Our income during that period of time, including tithes and offerings, designated funds like missions and benevolence, uh, an anonymous donation, ministry fundraising, building and other interest income, was $1,025,761, which leaves us at a deficit of $227,179. Please prayerfully consider whether you might be able to make a gift to help us close this gap. Thank you for your unwavering support. Your financial gifts are a testament to your commitment to our church's mission and vision and allows us to maintain our facilities, support our staff, fund our various ministries, and plan for future growth. Together, we are making a difference for God's glory and neighbor's good. Thank you very much.
streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above praise the mountain fixed upon it mount of thy the source of all that we have, all that we are. Every good and perfect thing comes from you. We give you thanks for all that you are, all that you've done, all that you are doing, all that you have promised to do. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So I thought this morning, given that we are heading into um, a stressful, anxiety-producing week for many of us, that it would be good to think about what it is that we do when we come to the table. Now, I mentioned in the first 
uh, section this morning that one of the ways that Jesus got into trouble with the religious leaders in his time was, uh, dis- was breaking Sabbath in their understanding of the law. Another way that Jesus got into trouble with the religious leaders is through what is called his table fellowship. In other words, the people that he hung out with, the people that he had dinner with, the dinner parties he went to. They were shocking, to say the least, to those religious, to the religious establishment. You see, part of keeping kosher, part of obeying and following the law as the Pharisees especially understood it was who it was that you broke bread with. And you most certainly did not break bread with people who were ritually unclean, which is another way of saying unacceptable. And so when Jesus would gather and uh, have table fellowship with tax collectors and prostitutes and publicans and all kinds of unsavory people, the religious establishment would clutch their pearls. They didn't like it. They didn't like it one bit. It was inappropriate. It wasn't acceptable. And uh, this has got to stop. But Jesus had a way of welcoming those people who were hungriest for God's presence. So as we come to the table this this morning in this season where we just continue to seem as a nation to get more and more fractured, we are reminded that we're invited to a table that does not belong to us. It belongs to Jesus. And that at that table are people whom we may feel, or quite honestly, <laughs> I mean, let's just, na- you know, let's just name it, we might know they don't belong. Right? I mean, we would never say it out loud, and we might never even admit to thinking it, but sometimes it's back in there, right? Well, they don't believe X, Y, or Z, or they do this, that, or, or they don't do this, that, or they, or they vote, or they, right? We have, uh, we have our own lists. And yet Jesus says to come to the table. One author wrote that the table reminds us that it is our shared brokenness and our shared healing through Jesus that ultimately unites us as brothers and sisters in the faith. We say in the, in the communion liturgy, in the invitation, that we don't come to prove a point or because we are righteous, but instead we, we come because we are in constant need of God's mercy and help. There's a lot of challenge in our world And a lot of things that are difficult for us to understand. And a lot of difficult conversations that that need to take place in the church. But at its center is the table. At the center of the church is the table that Jesus invites us to. It's the place where he reminds us that he is calling everyone to come. Barbara Brown Taylor wrote in her book, Searching for Sunday, said this about the church. She said, the church is God saying, I'm throwing a banquet and all these mismatched, messed up people are invited. Here, have some wine. N.T. Wright said this about the table. He said, when Jesus himself wanted to explain to his disciples 
what his forthcoming death was all about. He didn't give them a theory. He gave them a meal. Brothers and sisters, when we come to the table, we are receiving food for the journey. And we are being reminded that we are one. We don't aspire to be one. Uh, We don't accomplish being one. Jesus did that for us on the cross. The question then becomes, will we live as one? In the coming weeks, many of you will be tempted to conflate ideology with theology. Many of you will be tempted to think that somehow whatever happens on Tuesday has ultimate meaning for the kingdom of God. But the table says to us that the kingdom is already here. Even when we don't see it, and especially when it seems small. I'm always struck when you hear grandiose uh, and, and um, kind of flammatory rhetoric about the kingdom and fighting for the kingdom and all these things that, that Jesus never described it that way. Right? I mean, read the Gospels. Every place when Jesus talks about the kingdom, it's small. The kingdom of God is like yeast. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is these 12 hopeless messes that I called to be my disciples. So friends, whatever happens in the coming week, we have two things to hold in mind. The first is that the kingdom of God does not reside in Washington, D.C. The kingdom of God does not reside in the United States. The second question is this. Will you stay at the table? Will you stay at the table? That choice is ours. Jesus says, come to me all who are burdened. And who are weary. But we don't have to come. You can decide that your political ideology is more important than the kingdom. That's between you and God. I can't make that decision for you. But the invitation is the same. The table is open. All are welcome. If they will but repent and follow Jesus. We're going to spend some time before we go to the table in prayer. And I'm just going to guide you through... um, I wrote this prayer a while back, and it's kind of based off of uh, some themes from uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Life Together and his reflections about the church. I actually first wrote this uh, prayer in January of 21. Does that ring a bell for anybody? And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray out loud and then I'm going to uh, give space for silence for you to pray, for you to listen to the Spirit, and I'll give some instruction as each of those sections happens. And then after the prayer, we will move to the table. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God. We come before you in worship this morning desiring to bring all of ourselves to you. We give you thanks for the gift of community and all the blessing that it imparts in our lives. 
We give thanks for the support and joy that it provides. But Lord, we must confess that these days in our nation have strained our community and relationships, both within our church and in the wider community. God, we confess that we have become divided over many issues. Lord Jesus, come quickly and heal us. And so we ask, God, that you would help us to heal and strengthen our community and experience the joyful wholeness that your grace, your shalom brings so that we might better serve the world in your name. Holy Spirit, we recognize that true community is not possible without your empowering presence. So empower us now to forgive one another as in Christ you have forgiven us. In this time of silence, I ask that you would bring to mind any in our fellowship or in your family or in the community who you may need to forgive. And I invite you with the Spirit's leading to take steps this week to mend that, re that relationship. Holy Spirit, in these days, when life seems so fractious and stressful and anxious and angry, we pray, God, that you would help us to remember your call to us in Scripture to encourage one another. In this time of silence, I invite you to ask the Spirit to bring to mind someone that you can encourage this week. Spirit, you were promised to us by Jesus as the Comforter. And we recognize and remember your call to comfort one another. And God, we recognize that these political times cause pain for many in our community especially our brothers and sisters of color. And so, God, we pray that you would give us the ability to bring comfort to those who are afflicted, to comfort those who are wounded by our dangerous and violent rhetoric. So in these moments of silence, I invite you to lift up those who grieve or are struggling. And if someone in particular comes to mind, I invite you to reach out to them this week as the Spirit leads. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen.
going to move into our time of communion at this point. I'm going to remind you that uh, here in the, in the Covenant Church, we practice what is called an open table. That means that this table belongs to Jesus. If you desire to follow him, then you are welcome at this table. Um, the ushers will dismiss you by row. You can come down, receive the elements, and return to your seats up through the middle aisle. Friends, it is now our sacred privilege to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. All who humbly put their trust in Christ and desire his help, that they may lead a holy life. All who are truly sorry for their sins and would be delivered from them. All who would walk in love with their neighbors and intend to live a new life, following the commandments of God and walking now, from now on in his holy ways are invited to draw near with faith and to receive this holy sacrament. Brothers and sisters, come to this sacred table not because you must, but because you may. Come to testify not that you are righteous, but that you sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ and desire to be his true disciples. Come not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Not because you have any claim on the grace of God, but because in your frailty and sin you stand in constant need of God's mercy and help. Come, not to express an opinion, but to seek God's presence and to pray for the Spirit. Please join together as we confess our sins together. Most merciful God, do we have, no, there we go. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May Almighty God have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep us in eternal life. Let us pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father in heaven. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as they are delivered by the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks... He broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembering me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is the Lord's table. It is Jesus himself who invites you to this meal. All has been made ready. Let us keep the feast. Will the servers please come?
you're thirsty.
My prayer for us this week is that would be true of our own eyes, mind, that we would center our focus, center our hope on Jesus and the work that he has done bringing us together. It has been done, as Corey said. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, we are made one. It doesn't mean it doesn't take work on our behalf <laughs> to live into that. But my prayer is that we would believe that and hope for that and work towards that uh, as we go into our week and go into our lives past this week. Um, it doesn't change. God has made us one. We are one. And we have to live like it's true. So as we close our time together this morning, a couple of reminders. First of all, if you are desiring prayer this morning, Deborah, one of our prayer team members, is here at the front. She would love to pray for whatever it is that is on your heart. Also, I wanted to mention it went out in our Wednesday email, which if you don't get, you can sign up for on the web. Uh, the church will be open from 11 a.m. until 2 p.m. on Tuesday for prayer. And we have some prayer guides that um, we will have available if you would like to come and spend some time in prayer over your lunch hour. Receive now 
the benediction. Brothers and sisters, what we have been about here is not separate from life. Rather, these acts have been a reminder that we belong to Christ always and everywhere. We carry Christ's Spirit into our homes, our daily activities, all our relationships. We are Christ's people. By God's grace, let it be so. Amen.